Welcome to the Happily Different Podcast, where we unpack the interesting and unorthodox ways people approach their businesses and their lives. The mission of this show is to learn as much as we can from people who weren't afraid to go their own way. My name is Ryan Jaskowitz. I'm your host, as well as CEO of 12.5 Capital, a non-bank finance company helping companies accelerate the progress they are trying to make in their businesses and in their lives. Today's guest is the co-founder and CEO of Dare Biz Capital, an Austin-based commercial finance company specializing in providing non-bank capital to the construction industry. Previously, our guest was the co-founder of Far West Capital, which successfully sold Advantage Business Capital, a division of Central Bank. Prior to that, he started the factoring division of State Bank of Texas, which sold its factoring division to Gulf Coast Bank in 2007. In addition to his business ventures, he serves on numerous boards, loves Topo Chico, a dip in Barton Springs pool, is a collector of great meals and can do a standing tree pose with the best of them. Cole Harmonson, welcome to the show. Hello, Mr. Ryan. Thank you for having me. So full disclosure, Cole, Cole and I are extremely close friends. So this episode could go for five hours, but we will spare you that. Uh, to focus ourselves, we will be discussing mentoring and the specifics of how a good mentor-mentee relationship gets established. But first, you grew up in Lubbock, Texas, where I've been told you can watch your dog run away for four days. That's correct. What's the number one thing about West Texas that you think shaped your life? You know, it's a great question. I think it feels like a very, very small town. So I think everyone knows everyone else's business and you have to maintain your reputation in town. Now, I thought Lubbock was the center of the universe. <laughs> it is known as the hub, hub of the plains. Um, but I think being a very small town in the 80s uh, where everyone knows everyone, I thought that's how everyone's life was. So you, you put forward, you know, this persona. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's pretty much true today. Although the persona has, seems to have switched online and, and things get lost when it goes online. I think you when, know. when did you recognize that life wasn't like Lubbock or, or that the rest of the world wasn't necessarily like Lubbock? Well, I think I realized that at a pretty early age, you know, but seeing my dad's business, seeing, how people operated in town, seeing that, you know, there was this desire, effort, push, if you will, towards, quote, doing the right thing. I mean, yeah. just to answer your your first question, I think that is a core value of, of people from West Texas. Um, Why is that? You think? Per capita, I think there's more churches. There's also <laughs> more bars per capita. <laughs> so, you know, I, I learned pretty quickly that, you know, there was this is, you know, this is how everyone presents themselves. Why do they present themselves that way, though? I, I think it's I think it's historic. It's like, a farmer yeah. culture. It's a ranching culture. Right. It's a cowboy culture. And I think that is the culture of, of Texas in general. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife is who's from Oklahoma. She calls it the, the friendly Texas way, <laughs> you know, where, where people say things like, uh, Oh, bless your heart, mm -hmm. you know, which has the opposite meaning of, mm -hmm. you know, we'll screw those people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Did as well as you could, I guess. Uh, so you're, uh, like I said, I'm trying to, uh, at being such close friends here, trying to learn some new things. So you're one of three kids all raised in West Texas, right? Correct. Were there any inklings as a child that you thought, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur or that anything that sticks out? I mean, you just mentioned your dad ran a business. What kind of business was that again? Yeah, I think maybe when I turned eight years old, this was in the 80s, and he was, uh, he started a skate business, skate machine, you know, like roller skating. So roller skating was the thing. Um, and he worked for, <laughs> he worked for Xerox as a salesman for 20 years. And I would always see him come home after work in his suit and his tie and, you know, all of his stories about all of his successes. He was the number one salesman in the nation for Xerox at one point. Um, and I just looked up to him in so many ways that, you know, I thought, wow, you know, this is my dad, you know, just like everyone does. I think when, when you're a kid, but he's, he's quit that job. 
and he started the skate business, then he got into construction, then he got into the car business. And so he's, you know, he was an entrepreneur, you know, most of my adult life when I got to watch that. So did he do all those things at once or no, or was it like skate it business, was, done, construction, move on? Correct. Yeah. He, he, he did them sequentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think you're having, knowing your siblings, uh, one's an attorney, one's a doctor, what made them not go into the entrepreneurial field? Well, I would say my brother, you know, he owns two law firms, so it's, you know, okay. Yeah. I, I think that's, that could be counted as entrepreneurship for sure. Yeah. And my sister, you know, she has a, a, a deal that's based on what she produces, you know, in her right. medical practice. Right. So I think all of us just had... And I don't know what, I don't know what this is. And I don't know why, who knows mm -hmm. why, but you know, you said in an early age, did I have an inkling that I yeah. wanted to be an entrepreneur? Not really, <laughs> honestly, not That's really. Interesting. Yeah. I had the job you mentioned when, when I started the factoring ABL division for state bank in 96, I was given a blank page, you know, talking mm -hmm. about mentorship by my partner, still my partner today, uh, Don Strickland. You know, he just said, here's a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. we got two rules, make money and don't lose money. <laughs> um, and he treated me as a partner. He did not treat me as an employee. Mm -hmm. His example, I think, was probably the biggest influence on the way that I do things in terms of, quote, business, yeah. you know, how that yeah. goes. But he was for sure is to is still today a big part of my life a big part of my uh, mm -hmm. uh people i look up to the way things are done i think it's fair to say that you've had an entrepreneurial bone in your body the whole time it just didn't express yeah. itself maybe yeah. as early as others did like for example yeah. for me i was starting lawn care businesses and starting a boat detailing company yeah. and so that all started really early and it didn't express that self itself for you necessarily until you met Don, let's say, and we'll, yeah. we'll get to Don in a minute. Um, so it, it took somebody's trigger to sort of. Well, I think one of the themes I think we'll get to today is asking questions. And I think if you have an entrepreneur, everyone has an entrepreneurial bone in their body, I think. And I'll give you an example of this. So I started a factoring group for a, a bank before I met Don in Fort Worth. And it became very clear to me that they did not want me asking questions. <laughs> they just said, here's our box. Mm -hmm. And if you can live within this box, you can work here. And if you can't, you can't work here. And I thought to myself, this is never going to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the CEO of the bank, who a very, very successful bank, um, and they're still there today. Uh, great people. You know, they had their model, etc. But we sat down over a deal one day and he brought me into the boardroom. He's like, uh, Cole, is this your deal? I'm like, <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Brought it in here. And he said, well, we, we can't do this deal. I said, well, you got him in overdraft, a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. We're talking about a $200,000 line. This would save them money mm -hmm. and let them grow their business. And we could monitor it better. We would actually understand the collateral. And he's like, no. It's too much leverage. Yeah. So it became very apparent to me at that point. Right. So I think the difference between having the entrepreneurial drive yeah. and then answering that call, if you will, right. is the people who go, well, I hear what you're saying, but no, yeah. you know, I'm not doing yeah. that. You know? Well, that's my, that's my point is that you very early on in that role the, the, could go one of two ways. Yeah. You could have gone, all right, appreciate it. I'm just going to keep plugging away here at this yeah. for the next 50 years, 40 years yeah. and grow at this bank. And you clearly were like, no, I'm not, not going to do that. And yeah. I wonder if that comes from your parents though. Yeah. I think my dad, you know, when he was running the skate business or he was running his car business in Lubbock, you know, he would always tell me, you know, and he had all the sales training from Xerox right. and yeah. years of doing that kind of thing. And he would always tell me to imagine the word, so what, and a question mark on the forehead of the person that I was talking yeah. to. Yeah. Why are you talking to me? What yeah. does this mean to me? Yeah. And so I think because of that, and you can call that empathy, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But I think just having an awareness of the way other people are motivated and why they're motivated 
and then helping them to do what they want to do is the essence of an entrepreneur. I think, I think we're here to solve problems and to try to make other people's lives better at the same time. And maybe you make a little money, maybe you lose a little money, but you know, we're just, I think constantly scratching our own head, yeah. trying to answer that question yeah. of, well, so what, right? Why are you doing this? <laughs> right. Um, so your mom though, so let's, let's go to the other side. Okay. How, what was mom's impact on, on that? On, on just your, your, like with, with hindsight being what it is, if you said, okay, so sitting where I sit today, I don't, I don't understand it the same way I do today at 50 years old that I did when I was uh, a kid or growing up in high school or in junior high. But my mom is a, a I would say a devoutly religious uh, Christian person. And she has a commitment to her own self of a very deep, spiritual journey uh, Mm -hmm. of her own. Um, And that also got me asking lots of questions. So, you know, in, in my youth, it was, we go to church on Wednesday night, we go to church on Sunday. (laughs) Uh, If the church is open, we're going to be there. I went to school there. Right. Um, And so I think having this quote, albeit my version is extremely different today. uh, Having an idea of, of, Again, I think asking questions of what is this thing that we're doing here called life? Where did it come from and why are they doing it? I think that was my mom's biggest influence on me. And it, you know, she doesn't, she's not a proselytizer. She doesn't, um, any of that kind. She never has been. She doesn't Bible thump you. She doesn't, she's not a Bible thumper at all, but or she is a Bible thumper for sure. Um, <laughs> and, you know, she, it, it, she may be the only person that listens to this podcast, but, um, <laughs> she's my number one liker on social media. I'm like, sweet. I got my mom to like a post. You know, I think she, it was watching her and the way that she treated people and the way that she handled family relationships was huge, you know, um, and it still is huge. I mean, mm-hmm. she's still very much a center of gravity in our family, you know, in terms of what happens all the time. Right. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, kind of putting that into my system, if you will, at that point and, and for me to, you know, go off and sort of figure out what I need mm-hmm. to figure out at that point was, was a big influence. I wonder, I wonder, cause what everything I hear from you is consistency from her though. Yeah. And I think an important part of being an entrepreneur, even though, you know, if you only watch social media, it seems like entrepreneurs are crazy, high flying, you know, fly from the seat of their pants, but really the best entre- entrepreneurs are consistent. They show up every day when people quit. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's something there that her consistency of being so committed for so long. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. Um, and just in terms of what you just said about consistency, I do think it's a very underrated skill F- folks. I mean, there's a famous Bill Gates quote where he says people underestimate what they can do in 10 years and they overestimate what they can do in one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you think, you know, I'm going to apply all this energy and all yeah. this action yeah. and all these things are going to happen. Um, you and I both know, I mean, you've been an entrepreneur for, a very long time. Mm-hmm. And so you know that you, it's hard to predict. I think uh, intentionality is probably the better uh, thing that I learned along those lines. I think that came into more focus for me. Intentionality came mm-hmm. way more into focus for me when I started Far West. And we can talk about the mentor that I, yeah. I got mm-hmm. at that point, but um, John Henry McDonald, but you know, he, he showed me a bunch of things around writing, journaling, right. It's sort of yeah. boiling your authentic desires down to your what matters. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we could talk about a million things together. Uh, the title of this podcast is the happily different podcast. You obviously took a different approach towards starting this business. 22 years old is when you started the factoring division at state bank. Is that right? I think I was 25, 25. Okay. Yeah. Um, you were having kids at that point already had to get life going. So we could talk all about that, but instead we're going to focus on mentoring and mentorship. And so mentoring is a huge buzzword in business and entrepreneurial space. Everyone talks about needing a mentor, wanting a mentor. You should be a mentor. You should have it at your company. So to kick off the conversation in your words, what, what is mentor or mentoring in general to you? Well, I do think there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Uh, And I think the very first thing that you know, it is important for me 
uh, just as though we talked about this before. So like I would say Don Strickland, for example, I didn't ever quote, ask him to be my mentor. Same. If you will. Yeah. You know, it was more, I am going to ask a lot of questions. So mm-hmm. I think the first thing that is important in terms of mentorship is question asking. And so if you, you know, when you and I started working together a long, long time ago, mm-hmm. and you were my customer, right? You know, um, and you know, you asked me a ton of questions. You ask where do, you know, where do we start? Where do we go? Where, mm-hmm. How do, you know, what did you do? How mm-hmm. did you get there? Um, so I think having that attitude, you don't just pick out a mentor and go to them because you think they're famous or you think whatever right. you think, whatever. Right. I think it, you have to s- sort of search in your own heart and your own, you know, intentions, et cetera. Yeah. What is it that I'm looking for? And then I think those people show up in your life. And I don't think that they, I don't think it's something you have to really strive for, for a true sort of long-term kind of relationship. I think it's a long-term relationship, but I yeah. think, I think the most important part of it is questions. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, so I, I agree with all that. I agree with all that. I think what people struggle with is that everyone says to do these things and they go, okay, where do I go to the mentor shop? You know, where do I find this mentor? How do I do this thing? Yeah. And I think the point is that some of this is luck. Some of it's luck, and but some of it's the, like you're saying, the question asking of, I, I think from my seat, what I was looking for in a mentor which what we're trying to get to here is we're trying to get to the point of showing people these are tactically what actually happened to lead to a good mentor mentee relationship, let's say. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's many different ways that can come together. And I want to talk about how your two biggest mentors, I guess, uh, or let's say two of the biggest mentors, but yeah, that was definitely me saying that looking at this person saying on the outside, this person seems to be heading in the trajectory that I want to head in. Right. Let me ask him questions about how to do that. Yeah. I I think when you were talking a second ago, you said, let's do this. So I think that's the that's the second thing is that. The universe, if you will, I know that's a woo woo term, Mm -hmm. um, responds to one thing and one thing only in my mind, which is action, Mm -hmm. which is effort, which is putting forth you know, the, the actual demonstration of what your intentions are. So you weren't, uh, an employee somewhere you weren't, you were running a business. Mm -hmm. You taken the action to start. You were doing your thing. You were out lending money. You were making it happen, et cetera. So, you know, if, if anyone ever approaches me about, you know, how did you start this business or what did you do? You know, and that's what I turn around on them is more, more questions, generally speaking. And I would say, what is it that, that, what is it that you're authentically wanting here? And I encourage you to do some writing about that and sort of think about that and then go do it. Yeah. And then we can talk. Yeah. Because most of it is just, Ass talking, if you will. <laughs> ass, ass talking. There's Write that down. Of, That's note number one. There's uh, the, mentor ass talk. There's a lot of ass talkers. Um, and is that a Texas term? Ass talking. I don't know. I don't, Sounds like uh, coming out of your I, mouth. I think it could be, but I think it's just there's so much, you know, hype, and there's so much on social media. I think that you know the kids these days, if you will, are seeing. <laughs> And they have an interpretation of what it means Mm -hmm. uh, to run a business or to own a business or to do whatever your particular endeavor is, because the things that you see on social media are the the one percent of the one percent. And and it's not, you know, the the quote small businesses. There's 28 million small businesses in the United States. Right. And. We're not hearing about a lot of them. Right. We see Elon. We see <laughs> Richard Branson. Well, even beyond that, we see a lot of these small businesses that take off and everyone's like, oh, look at that overnight success. And if you do a little digging, right. it's a 15 year old business right. that pounded the rock for 15 years. Right. And then one day it broke. Yeah. You're like, oh, look, that works. But everybody sees it on Instagram or whatever. And Tito's, you- Tito's Vodka is a great example of that. They lost money for 11 years in a row. Um, you know, it's well over worth billions of dollars right. today. Yeah. 
Um, but he started because he was going to tell everyone no. They said, you can't have a distillery. He went and looked up the law and mm-hmm. showed it to the regulators and said, oh, yes, I can yeah. based on your own law. Yeah. And he's the first person that ever did that. Ever did it in and, Texas, right? And so he started doing something that he was extremely passionate about and that he felt called to, mm-hmm. if you will. Yeah. I think the other thing is like people's version of success has just become, I think, so distorted mm-hmm. um, and what it means for people to be successful in their lives, uh, I think needs a redefinition. Uh, <laughs> for sure. You know, I mean, that was part of, that was part of the, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, as part of our relationship, I was exposed to things very early in life that have given me tools now that I'm later in life to deal with some of the challenges and some of the things that I, you thought you wanted in life, the things that you thought meant happiness, success, whatever it might be. I was exposed to those things really early. So I feel like I had cheat codes, you know, kind of at this stage in my life. So I appreciate that. I wanted to talk about what I saw in you sort of as a mentor, but also what you saw in me because it's a Mm -hmm. two way street. Right. I think we started our conversation before I was your customer. Sure. So absolutely. Because like, the easy way would, to say it would be, I was your customer. You said, well, I just want to make my customer happy. How right. do I, you know, encourage right. this That came later. That, that came, came later. That came out of it later. It may have been like four or five years later. It's true. True. Yeah. So, and I just want to pull on that thread a little bit because I think what people want to hear is, what was it that the mentor saw in the mentee that made the relationship happen? I think the first thing you said was I was asking a lot of questions. And it is true that... You answered a lot of questions with questions, which early was very annoying, by the way. Mm-hmm. I'm, You're welcome. In, in the most positive <laughs> way possible. But, you know, you'd get this question like, well, what do you want? And I think part of that is, you know, when you pull on that thread a little bit is forcing a 20, let's say, five year old is when maybe when I met you and I'm mm-hmm. 38 now. So call let's call it 10 to 13 years. We've known each other. A 25 year old being asked that question. Nobody asks a 25 year old that question. I was, I was willing to ask you the questions to try to pull that out, but you could have just given me an answer. You could have said, do this, 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 and this, and go on. But you didn't yet. You you asked questions. You made me think through those questions. Was there anything else that was like, and I'm not trying to get my own tires pumped here, but was there anything else specifically that you were like, other than maybe just liking me, assuming that was the truth. Yeah. You know, was there anything else that you were like, you it's know, a big what? Assumption. I want to, in- <laughs> <laughs> I want to invest in this guy. Cause that's what you did. You invested in me in a lot yeah. of ways financially, but also more importantly, you invested spiritually, mentally, you know, as a friend. So anything there that you think of that you're like, well, that's part of the reason other than question asking. Yeah. You know, I think it was mostly because you did take the time to notice what was going on and, and again, ask questions. I think that is, again, we've talked about this a bunch, but already, but most folks don't do that. They don't take time. They don't have any questions. Um, I also think that what I was taught early on was that, you know, if you have the question, you actually have the answer somewhere inside you, but, you learn way more from your own discoveries than other people's revelations. And so I went through years of, you know, having the same questions asked of me and Mm -hmm. having to do the homework myself and going back to figure out. But I I mean, from a, from a profile perspective, I think it was your consistency. Like you've mentioned, I could, you know, we met at conferences. I saw you in the industry, you know, you were, a extremely young guy in a room full of extremely, you know, older people. Um, and, <laughs> I have that note too. And, and then I think there was just, you know, curiosity on my part to see what, what can be, you know, I was, it, was there any, was there any pay it forwardness at that point yet? You think given the fact that you had two mentors, I don't know if I consciously had that, had that thought. I just think that's part of my personality, right. you know, is that, you know, I will help people who want to help themselves. And I, I could clearly see that, you know, there was lots of actions that you were taking and lots of success that you were already having. Um, maybe I'm slightly down the road from you a little bit, but you know, it didn't, didn't matter to me. You know, that was part of our mission and part of our vision of what we do. You know, you and I both Mm loan money to companies and we know how hard it is to run a business and we know, 
you know, all the challenges that come along with it. So any, any help that we can give any, I don't want to call it advice because I think advice is just, you know, someone else's experience. I think you have to get down into your own experience, which is, is way more difficult than Mm -hmm. anyone actually thinks because we're given, you know, my, my coach that I have now, he calls it stable data. You know, you're given your stable data as a extremely small child when you grow up Mm -hmm. and most people don't take time to, to question that and they just go about their programming, if you will, right. until, until they don't. Right. right? And yeah. they don't have those questions. And so I think, again, I think that's a commonality between entrepreneurs. I think we just, you know, we're two peas in a pod. Right. You know, as far as personalities go. It does. It, yeah. It doesn't hurt that our personalities lined up real nicely. Right. And I, I don't know what to make of that. Cause like on one hand you could say, is that what you want in a mentor or do you want someone that is, is, is different than you? Right. So that, like, that's one way to look at it, but also, you know, you, I think you're giving yourself or you're not giving yourself enough credit in the fact that you could have easily been like, piss off kid. Like th- th- that happens all the time. So I think there's something to be said for that. Now, you know, what kind of advice is that to mentors or mentees? Like, you know, if you want to be a mentor, I mean, the, it, it seems easy, but the, the first thing you have to do is give people time. So it was very interesting that in an industry that wouldn't give me time at 23 years old, I had somebody who was willing to give me time, right? You, you know, yeah. had some perceived success and was willing to give me time if I asked the right questions and whatnot. Um, and just candidly for everybody, literally how we met was, I'm curious who remembers, maybe we talked about this a little bit, but we were at a conference in Miami the way I remember it, and we've all heard the uh, the uh, Malcolm Gladwell podcast about like everyone's memories are different of these moments in their lives. <laughs> I remember walking in to a conference of gray old men, right? And I'm 24, 25 years old. And I see one younger looking guy in mm-hmm. the back. And I was like, oh, I'm going to sit next to that guy. <laughs> like literally, that's how it happened. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm Ryan. You're like, hey, I'm Cole. And then... Yeah, it kind of went from there. That's the, I mean, that's the way I remember it. And then I think you were nice enough to invite me to a meal, like whatever. You probably didn't want to have dinner with any of those other people. <laughs> and so, uh, which is still to this day, probably what we do the most. Um, is that kind of how you remember? Yeah. It? Yeah. Know? That's exactly how I remember it. Yeah. And the point is that like, you always have to be looking it's happenstance. Like that is mm. complete luck, complete. You, you could say it's the universe bringing us together in some ways, but it's also on the other side, it's just luck. It's, it's noticing, Oh, this person gave me the time of day, but unless I took the initiative to sit down next to you to ask you those questions, you'd have been like, Oh, that was a nice guy, but no, move on with my life. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think, you know, the way I view it is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a good company here with Walt Whitman, but you know, he, the universe is always conspiring on your behalf, you mm-hmm. know, to, to lay down things, to make your, your experience as easy as it can be. And it doesn't seem easy, you know, and all of the experiences that life hands you. But I think at the end of the day, you know, uh, life is just a big playful puppy you know, <laughs> at the end of the day. Cause it's, it's too funny not to be. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, I just want to make sure we talk about this a little bit, but did you, did you at the moment even look at it as being a mentor to me? No. Was it not? No, a, I, I, I thought, you know, I still do. I, I look at it more as a friendship. Um, I think I was the one that called it a mentor before yeah. you. And I, I think, and this speaks volumes about you. I don't think you ever liked that either. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you liked that I called it that because it has this air of pretentiousness to it. Yeah. I think that says something about you, you know? Yeah. I think there's, you know, I'm always a little suspicious of, of folks who put themselves out there as, you know, LinkedIn title mentor, yeah, yeah. thought leader, <laughs> call me and I'll tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, you know, because everybody's circumstances are different. Everybody's goals are different. Everybody's intentions are different. You know, life is a one player game. It's a one player game. Whether you realize it or not, it's a one player game. Um, and your experience is 
whatever is in your, the relationships that you have, the everything that you have is, is derived from your, your intentions and your actions. And again, I think we can talk about that all day. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of, part of the, I want to be, I want to say this the right way. Part of it is just this intentionality that you keep talking about. Like mm-hmm. you, the intentionality of trying to find what it is you want in life and finding someone to help you ask those questions, not answer your questions and also not tell you how to live a successful life. I think that that seems to be like the theme I'm getting from you here. And also the theme of our relationship, which is I get a lot of, uh, people who I, I now get to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, unlike you, I do recognize it though, because I think I have this, I'm always in my head, of course. And I'm, I can, (laughs) I can see, Oh, this is a chance for me to really invest in this person like Cole did for me. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's me recognizing here's an opportunity to show some love to some people that are looking for some help. Right. And um, where it doesn't go well is when people say, oh, my God, you're so successful. You're so this. How how do I do it? Yeah, that's that to me is the wrong the wrong approach. If we're looking, if we're trying to give people tactical tools of how to find a, partner. you know, I, I might disagree with you a little bit about that because I did. Well, that's what's great about a podcast. When I, when I started far West, um, right after we sold the portfolio to, uh, Gulf coast and first community in 2007, I went to work for Gulf coast and I fig- again, figured out very quickly that corporate culture you know, matters so much, you know, and again, those guys have been incredibly successful and I like them all and know them all, uh, they're good, great people, etc. but it was not a match because it's not a culture match, you know? And, and again, I had been working with Don for so long, you know, 96 to 2007, where he would call me once or twice a month mm-hmm. and look at the reports and then just ask questions and, <laughs> You yeah. know, think about what we were going to go do going forward. And so when I, when I, Don became my partner at that point, I was not his employee. So I realized yeah. I needed another perspective right. as an out, kind of an outside, outside of Don, an outsider's view. Can we, can we talk about Don a little bit though? Yeah. Give us the two minutes on Don. <laughs> Don is like the one of the coolest human beings on the planet. I mean, he really is just a, wonderful guy. He's, he does not work hard and he's been incredibly successful. <laughs> I'm sure he'll love to hear that. <laughs> he does not. Uh, he's all about action. Yep. He's all about example. He's not about talking. Mm-mm. He does not do any talking for the most part. And that's the biggest thing that I learned from him because I watched during the time that I worked at state bank, we, we had, we started as a, $73 million bank. We ended as a $2 billion bank with 41 locations. Damn. We had one location when we started 41 wow. locations. We had an SBA business. We had a factoring business. We had a mortgage business. We had an insurance business. We had a wealth management business. <laughs> we had a commercial lending platform. Yeah. And so you look at that and you think, wow, this guy must be such a hard charger. Yeah. You know, no. he's just like a hard charger guy, Yeah, you know, but Don understands people. He understands respect and he understands how to attract the best people. Really, you need to exemplify that um, and and treat other people in a way in which it gives them the opportunity to go and do things. And so that was the exact same formula that we adopted at Far West and we attracted some awesome people. I think there's three other CEOs right now that used to work at far West, you mm. know, that are out, you know, uh, Casey Conlon at dare. Now he jokes and calls it the Cole Harmonson coaching tree. I'm like, well, coaching you know, tree, yeah. that's hilarious, but you know, we, it was more about giving people a platform and, and a way for them to flourish. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you know, they have to be the type that flourish, mm-hmm. but you know, I learned real quick that Don just didn't put up with any bullshit either. So it was like, we were at a, sales call around when I first started working there. Um, and you know, we were, we'd take the chief credit officer myself, Don, who was the CEO of the bank and like another loan officer with us. This is like a $4 million opportunity in the middle of the call. 
the guy said something that Don just didn't like, and Don <laughs> slams his fist on the table and says, okay, we'll see you later. All right, we're going to go now. And we uh-huh. got up and walked out. No way. Yeah, you know, and so don't waste time on shit that, you know, yeah. that you that you, you get a feeling about. Yeah. Um, or or people. He fired the CFO in like a month, you know, the legacy CEO yeah. CFO, and then he brought in his own team. So he was just all about the vibes, the good vibes with people and doing what he said he was going to do. You could always trust him. You could always know that when you, you know, if if he said he was going to do something, he was going to do it. Um, And most of our arrangements were handshake arrangements and picking good people to do business with. And I think that's, that was his greatest strength is his greatest strength still. Whoa, 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 you're bearing the lead though. He has the body of a Greek god. Yeah. At how old is he now? I think he's 61. Yeah. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. So it's you, real, men, you mentioned all those things, but like it, it's a real like a professional it's very semi professional bodybuilder, no? Like Yeah, no, it's very now annoying. he does track and field and Yeah, he um he I think when he was forty six, he saw a picture of himself sitting by a pool and he said, I can't believe that's me. You know, that you know, I think he weighed two fifty at the time. By the time he was 50, it was right when we started uh, yeah. Far West together. He was in a bodybuilding competition. He was down to like 196. I think he's like 210 today. Stacked. 6'4", handsome as hell. Handsome. It, you know, there's what, nobody that looks more Texas. What's so annoying is everywhere you go with him is, you know, people will pull you to the side. What, what kind of workout does this <laughs> What does he do? I mean. Oh, you don't want to hear about he, mine? What, I mean, I, I'm pretty much into yoga. Were you, yeah. you want to know anything yeah. about that? Or I could talk to you about it. But, no. you know, it was like Don who, you know, it's just, he's just, a, he's a sweet guy. He, he's That's the truth. He's, That's uh, the truth. He's awesome. We, 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 we don't work together day to day. Uh, we still have an interest in Far West together, but he's just an awesome guy and very much. Uh, very much a giver, but not someone who will put his what what is it what's the saying don't toss your pearls before swine right he's not he won't do that yeah no he's you know? got no time for it yeah no he's, he's got he he's mess, got money to count doesn't mess around <laughs> doesn't mess around um okay, so you said that uh he was your men probably well it's fair to say your first what you would consider a traditional mentor in yeah. some way shape or form for sure. But then became your business partner, which you said, then you realized, okay, I need something else outside of this. Yeah. So there was two things happening there. Obviously, you were transitioning from mentor to a new mentor, but it sounds like you were actually recognizing, hey, this guy was my mentor. You know, it wasn't just a, yeah. this guy was my mentor and I need something else outside of it. How did you make that transition? What did it look like? How did you find this other person? And what's his name and background and all that? Yeah. So I met John Henry. McDonald and he is a finance guy too. And that's what attracted me. And he wore bow ties and had a TV show here in Austin. He's retired now, sold his company, but I met him and I said to him, I want to come to your office and I want to sit down with you and talk to you. Is that okay? Sure. And you know, he's a former drill sergeant, you know, big mean mustache, you know, <laughs> he's very gruff out yeah. exterior personality. Yeah. Um, was in Vietnam, you know, has wow. gone from freaking rags to riches, yeah. you know, lived on an Indian reservation at one point. Oh I mean, very interesting guy. Yeah. And I said to him, when we sat down, I said, and this is where my disagreement comes in. I said, John Henry, I just want to ask you, like, how did you build this business? Mm-hmm. Like what you went from point A to point B. Yeah. And he goes, interesting. He goes, no one's ever asked me that question before, which I would found shocking. <laughs> right. I, I, yeah. At that point yeah, in my life, I'm 36 years old and I, I, I'm sitting here thinking this guy has built the number one asset management business in Austin, Texas and great reputation, et cetera. And no one's ever come and sat down with him. It just, that blew me away. He pulls out this big journal, you know, like this one right here. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, well, I've been writing in this every day since 1984. That was the answer. He said, you know, (laughs) do you want to be a two percenter? Mm -hmm. He said, because most people will not take time to write down their goals Mm -hmm. or their intentions. Right. Just, Just won't do it, you know, for whatever reason. He said, so there's your secret. Then the the secret is not 
what I just revealed to you, the secret is actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's half of the things you're talking about here. I mean, yeah. all of these items that we're discussing are, are so on, on the surface, they look so easy. And I imagine the one listener that's listening to us is going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That sounds too easy. But I think that's so much of life. It, I don't know if this quote actually applies necessarily, but the easy way is the hard way and the hard way is the easy way. I, I think we perceive that things are harder than they are. That, yeah. that literally, I mean, part of the thing that drew me to you was the idea of personal development and, and, and you exposed me to the same things that John Henry exposed yeah. you to. And I said, Oh, okay. That seems too easy, but let me give it a shot. Yeah. Sure enough, you start doing it and you're like, wait, this, this works. I think, I think you, you've, we've talked about it a million times. So the theme of this episode should be action really, but yeah. the action of, you know, somebody giving you advice and saying, um, you know, journal. Or write your goals down so you can look at them and think about them. I think most people just don't do it. Yeah. To be honest, I get calls all the time from people who go, you know, I'll have these similar types of conversations. Like, tell me what you did to get started. Tell me what you did to do this. And I was like, okay, I'm going to walk you through a couple of these things. So six months later, you ask them and have you written one thing in your journal? The system we learn as children, as high schoolers is not effort. Mm -hmm. What we learn and I heard this from somebody the other day. We can talk about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's very interesting what they said. Here's what I heard the other day from a CEO of, of, a, of an organization that I'm part of. And he said, we don't care about effort. We just care about outcomes. And we were on a call with a bunch of other people. I couldn't, you know, if I could have raked my nails on the chalkboard, <laughs> I would have. But it's the opposite of that. But we don't get taught that as far as, quote, systems go. What we get taught is better make your grades. Mm -hmm. You got to get your A. And if you don't, you're not going to get into this Mm -hmm. school. You're not going to go here. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. I told my 15-year-old nephew, I said, listen, today, I mean, I think it's okay to go to school and go to college and be smart. He Mm -hmm. makes straight A's. He's a very smart kid. I said, but, you know, he's talking to me about a business he wanted to start. And I said, what you... If you want to start that business, people who start those businesses, they just start them. Right. You ain't gonna learn <laughs> they shit. just start them. And the ones who've been incredibly successful, the ones that you hear about, the Bill Gates of the world, they dropped out of school. Yep. They focused on what they were focusing on. Mm-hmm. And it grew into this thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And again, luck and timing and, yeah. and all that played a part as well. But I think what gets... There's a great book. If I can recommend one book, yeah. I would say I would say Mindset by Carol mm-hmm. S. Dweck. I wish I would have had it before I parented my children because I think it would have helped me to understand that the key is is focusing on what you can control. It's a serenity prayer, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's focus on the things that you can control and the things that you can control are how many phone calls am I going to make today? How, you know, am I going to, here's my effort that I'm going to put towards towards this. And then the thing that you learn over a really long period of time, I think, or maybe I learned it over a really long period of time was that is to be completely and totally unattached to the outcomes. Yeah. Because if I'm striving for something and they're so, you know, far west and then the sale and then starting dare um, with my partner, Deborah, you know, it's it's been a very different sort of management experience in in terms of how we run the business together um, today than it was when I was at far west. And I know that um, even when I was writing and journaling during that time, I was putting way too much pressure on myself to hit a certain Absolutely. number, yep. you know, I need to get this many millions of dollars I've been there. Uh, in yeah. revenue. I need to get this uh-huh. thing and that thing. And so it's not, it's not the fact that you can't have something that you aspire to. That's tangible, a quote, smart goal, if you will. It's not that you can't do that. I think that again, and this is another thing that I think Don was just, a, you know, was a, was a genius about, you know, he never, he never really got into that whole, you know, this whole thing. It's like, well, let's kind of see what can happen. Well, we went from one location to 41. We went from 73 yeah. million to 2 billion. We went public during all that from, time. let's see what happens, you know, from, <laughs> I mean, again, all from intention and effort and showing up, yeah. you know, but, um, I don't think that you have this, um, I think if you have this overly 
attached to outcome sort of attitude, you're going to be frustrated because the goalposts will move and they move and they keep moving. You yeah. know, it's that Absolutely. hedonic treadmill yeah. that people yeah. talk about. Yeah. You know, you get one thing, you want the next thing. And so, because you think it's, it's mimetic, you know, yeah. it's, it's, a, you know, so Ryan has a, a turbo and, you know, so I want a turbo or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. the thing is yeah. that you see on social media or whatever, then you're going to want to, go get that thing and do that. And again, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but being rewarded by the effort itself is not something that you see celebrated. No. And you don't see the behind, you're a runner. I was just going to bring up that's, it's all the every day. It's the, it's the effort. It's the, it's the, I always talk about this. We, we train for six months at a time, let's say. Yeah. Run a race within, 30 minutes, I'm over the race. I'm over whatever outcome was good or bad. Mm -hmm. I'm not celebrating anymore, whether it was a PR. I'm not celebrating or I'm not. Maybe I'm still sad that it was a bad race, maybe. But, you know, I've moved on to the next training cycle in 30 minutes or an hour. You know, I've moved on to the next thing. So it clearly shows that the thing that I value most is the training cycle. It is the every day getting Mm -hmm. out there pounding the pavement, doing it. And that could be anything in life. Right. And I think I, I think we all, uh, we always talk about the pendulums. Right. And I think early in my personal development, you know, mentoring with you and all that kind of stuff, I think I did go to that side of outcomes because in my, in my mind, it was like, all right, focus on these outcomes, get these outcomes, whether it's a certain type of car or watch running a certain type of race, a certain amount of money. And I think, like life is just one big pendulum. Right. And so I think what I've realized now is the goals that you're setting, the ones you're writing down that we said were so important are mm-hmm. not about actually reaching those goals. I think it's about pointing the boat in the right direction. Yeah. And I've even over the last couple of years gotten away from the word goal. Yeah. Um, so when I do my writing now, it's not, it's, it's my intentions and there's, I, I use this little format and, but I scratch out the word goal mm-hmm. and I put this is my intention. I here. intend to. And how did I get to my intention is a good question. You know, like how do you arrive at what your intentions are? Mm-hmm. And I think everyone has sort of the the big buckets of, you know, health and family and work mm-hmm. and career yeah. and, you know, all those sort of things. But I think that work, you know, it's turtles all the way down on that deal. <laughs> yes, uh, it is. Because I think you, you, you have to go back and ask yourself, what are you here to do? What are you here to do? And what I learned again, after selling far West was that there were a lot of things that I was doing that I was checking the box on slash, um, doing because I thought I quote should, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I think should, should be a cuss word. <laughs> um, my friend, Chris Turner calls it fog, fear, obligation, and guilt. Mm hmm. And so if you're making, de- if you're making decisions out of fear, obligation or guilt, you're in the fog yeah. and you know, it's, it's not authentic. God, and, that's good. And you know, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris Turner. You know, he, he, he helped me see that a long time ago, but it's something that again, go back to that stable data programming, mm-hmm. you know, you have a company and you have all these employees and you, and wow, well, you know, know, this is what I should do. Yeah, oh, I definitely feel that we, for we, sure. We can again no about it. We can go back to the kind of the esoteric part of all this and see that okay, if I have a company, I'm supposed to be doing this company because it's it's my authentic desire and the steps were lined up. Mm-hmm. Like for Dare, it was not hard at all. Yeah. It was very easy. All the things came along. Yeah, if you looked at them in reverse, you would think, "Wow, that happened in 45 days." You yeah. know, all these seemingly impossible things that could conspire together yeah. so you could be doing what you're doing right now. And so I think there's a there's an element of trust and surrender that one must face. Yeah. And, you know, that is a a, a quality that I don't think gets talked about a whole lot. But I mean, I have complete trust and faith that you know, whatever's going on right now is from a highest good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, and, and <laughs> it's not easy to see in the moment. No. You know, but once you sort of let go into that, okay, here's where we're headed. And if this is what 
this is on the menu. This is what's on the menu. Right. And so, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. Let, let's, let's, <laughs> let's see what that has. To I feel bring. like that's not talking enough in mentoring relationships either though. Like there's circling a, back to that. It's not, there's it's not a, talked about this trust and surrender of, and I think that's what, I think that's what gets fearful. Cause like, let's circle back to just the journaling, right? You, okay. This guy tells you, you ask him, how did you do it? And he shows you a book to journal in. Yeah. There's a lot of trust and surrender to go, Oh, this is all I have to do. Not all you have to do, right. but like, Oh, okay. I'm going to do that. Right. You know, cause there's nothing tangible about it. You're not selling anything. You're not seeing any money come in. You're not doing. So that idea of trusting your mentor yeah. in some way and trusting what they're saying, I think that's, that's, that's kind of a, uh, it's an interesting little thing. And I also wonder, do you think that people have to go through those struggles of attachment, of setting goals, of realizing they're on the hedonic treadmill? Is there any way for a mentor to teach somebody? Cause you went through it. I went through it. Is there any way to teach somebody that, or is it literally just the wisdom of experience? Does that make any sense? That question? Yeah. Just trying to- yeah. I don't, I, I think the, the pain and gain and loss and addition uh, is the cycle of human existence. That's what we, you know, the drama, the tragic comedy, whatever you want to call whatever this life is, that is who we are as human beings. It's been that way, you know, looking back as far as recorded history goes, the oldest story is the story of the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the first recorded thing is the story of the hero's journey. I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but that's one thing that we, we do at dare. We answered the question of why are we doing this with that question, with, mm-hmm. with that answer of the entrepreneurial journey is the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. So sometimes locating yourself on that map <laughs> <laughs> is important yeah, to do yeah. and to be able to step back from that and see it. And say, okay, there is nothing that's quote happening the inside of my life that has not happened to every single other entrepreneur, every single other human being. Uh, but I, we, need to pull, we need to pull on that though, because I do, I do, that's a How, note I have here is part of what I think makes a good mentor relationship is open and honesty about the struggles that somebody else has. Cause when I talk to you, yeah. I can go, Oh, he already had that problem. Yeah. So what I want to encourage people is not that when you get a mentor, that mentor is going to tell you how to do everything. And all of a sudden you're not going to have any pain. Mm-hmm. Oh no. Yeah. You're going to have lots of pain. Yeah. Lots of pain. The yeah. point of the mentor mentee relationship, let's say, or as silly as that sounds to say, but the point of it is to have that feeling of, Oh, that person's been there before that person survived, came out through the other side. Yeah. I need to recognize that in the moment where I'm at now. Yeah. I think to answer your question, you know, of can, can you help someone in this regard? I think that's how I also would say that there are lots of great stories out there that we probably all take for granted that demonstrate this, this principle, those, those principles as well. So I think, you know, there's a great book. Um, Michael Singer is the guy who wrote The Untethered uh, Soul. And he was on Oprah and this the whole thing blew up, right? Yeah. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. But he wrote a book after that called The Surrender Experiment. Okay. Never heard of it. And The yeah. Surrender Experiment was his his documentation of his entire life, just letting go and saying, okay, universe, whatever you got. Yeah. And it went from a trailer to the FBI to a billion-dollar company. Yeah. All of which, you know, he, yeah. he was just sitting by a stream one day mm-hmm. and had some, you know, enlightening experience yeah. and just yeah. said, hmm, whatever life brings me, I'm just going right. to accept it. Right. So I think that somebody that rolls with the, uh, the plot twists. So yeah. Like, That's my niece. My niece says, uh, you know, when, when something comes up that uh, gives her a worry, she says plot twist. Yeah. It's her way of dealing with, okay, all right, this is the plot twist of my life. Let me yeah. go down this road, I guess. Yeah. And just roll with it. Yeah. I think the entrepreneurs are the folks who, you know, for whatever reason, have answered the call in, in terms of 
where you are in the, in the hero's journey. So you're automatically an adventure seeker. You're automatically someone who wants to understand more. I think if you ask those questions, you will also get the answers. They mm-hmm. may not be what you want them to be. Be careful what you ask but for. But you'd be yeah. damn sure careful yeah. what you ask for. And yeah. I remember you'll John, get it. John Henry used to tell me that, you know, we, we would be writing and he would say, well, you know, watch what you ask for. So what, what happened after we, you know, met the first time is he said, yeah, I've got a group and we meet every Friday morning. And I think, you know, it's still going on. That group's still yeah. going on. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. But it's funny. You you get what you ask for yeah. in so many ways in life, but it just doesn't come the way you thought it was going to come yeah. about. Not the easy way usually either. Yeah. The, the purpose, you know, we, I got on this purpose kick, um, like a lot of other kicks yeah. that entrepreneurs get on to. Mm-hmm. I got on this purpose kick, you know, way back when, um, and thinking about the conscious capitalism folks, you know, call it 2000. 10 ish, um, got involved with that and, and heard Roy Spence talk about unleash your potential and what all that meant. Who's Roy Spence? Roy Spence is the guy who, uh, founded GSDNM here in Austin. What do they do? It's a global, uh, advertising agency. Oh, okay. got it. I mean, they did Southwest Airlines. Oh, they yeah. Cool. Help create that. Mm-hmm. It's a giant company yeah. that just sold. And he's a great speaker and he was an attendee here and he, pops up and, you know, starts proselytizing all, all yeah. this stuff. But Unleash Your Potential, you know, means a lot. It means something very different to me today. Yeah. You know, here we are 2022 than it did when I first started working on it. Right. Um, mainly in the sense that, um, w- again, watch what you ask for mm-hmm. because how you learn uh, I've heard this quote before. The human being is a self-fertilizing animal. We rise up from our own shit <laughs> yeah. or not at all. Or not at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you get to see what's going on with with your belief structure, if you mm-hmm. will, because yeah. we all have a bunch of, quote, again, going back to that word, stable data, programming, beliefs, whatever you want to call it. We all have a bunch of beliefs in our head. You know, the first one that got popped was, you know, the tooth fairy, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you, that, I'm so, not going to let my kids listen to this. Yeah. So, you know, Santa Claus and the next Santa Gate, you know, was the next one. And, and so I think over your lifetime, you just get exposed to things that, you know, you thought were true, but they're, you find out that they're actually not true. Right. Um, and so, you know. Like, well, I think part of that, though, then is if the mentee is looking for a mentor i think something to look for is some flexibility in that mentor Mm. some some openness from that person to say i was this way once yeah that served me i'm now this way yeah because i've learned and i've changed it doesn't negate all the things i did before maybe i don't do those things anymore but i'm also going to change in the future i'm always open to those things i think because i want to talk just briefly about what when do these relationships go bad when are they harmful? And I think that may be one of those where you've, you find a mentor who's so stuck in their ways and you feel, you know, they go bad when it's a cult. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. give me all your money. Give me all your money. Usually it involves giving money. There's a sexual uh, component. Sexual <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, you see that all the time. Yeah. You know? I think what I, yeah, jokes aside, I mean, that's true. Obviously that's not yeah. where you want to head, but I think, lionizing, maybe that's not the right word, but making, you know, you talked about the hero's journey, Mm -hmm. making your mentor, your hero, Mm -hmm. I think can be a struggle Yeah, because we all have cracks. Right. And so like, if I made you my absolute hero Mm -hmm. and I learned about your cracks, it almost is like it, it, Mm. it washes everything else you told me away. Yeah. Right. While I looked at you as a mentor, you weren't my hero by any means. Right. You know what I mean? I did not put you up on a pedestal. I, I, aspired to things you did, but I did not, I knew you had flaws. And I think if I didn't, that would have been a problem. The biggest mistake people make, I think when looking at the hero's journey, if people do that, right. When you read a book, let's call it, uh, uh, which any good story, Lord of the Rings, et cetera, you know, it's going to be a story of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. You, the the one mistake you can make is that you're thinking about that as, as a story about someone else. Mm-hmm. It's not a story about someone else. So, in, in other words, this is life's a one player game. I'll say that again. And you're the hero of your life. And guess what? It's going to be over just like that. Mm-hmm. 
So answering the call and doing all those things, I think a mentor, again, going with Lord of the Rings here, you know, Gandalf, he had skin in the game, Mm -hmm. right? Me and you, when we worked together, I had skin in the game with you. Yeah. Right. I mean, literal. Yeah. You know, and, and if you're successful, I'm successful. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, (laughs) yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Right. 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 So, you know, Don and I, right. That's getting in the game together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think there's, there's really something to that idea of you're going to find your people when you answer your own call, Mm -hmm. you're going to find, you know, those people are going to show up. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're, it's going to show up in a way that's probably very unexpected. And you might, it's probably going to be painful. You actually. might not even be thinking about, Oh, this person's my mentor. You might just be thinking about, okay. well, that dawns on you later. Yeah. You go, I mean, I mean, truthfully, we talked about the tactics of how our relationship started, but it wasn't for many years down the road where I go, Oh, f- oh shit. I have a mentor. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> look how this worked out. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I feel like as a mentor, if, if, if a mentor or somebody who wants to be a mentor is listening to this, I think part of that lesson though, is don't hide your flaws in front of your mentee necessarily. Yeah. Cause I think that can happen too, where people go, no, I got it all put together. It's sure. all figured out. We see it in, with celebrities and with, you know, people on TV all the time where it looks like they've got it all figured out cause they hide this part of their life rather than just being open and honest. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, you said that earlier, you were like, I think you don't like this title. And I'm like, no, I don't actually like this title (laughs) because I don't feel like I'm trying to go out to purposefully teach anyone anything. I I go out answering my own call and Mm -hmm. taking my own journey Mm -hmm. and figuring out where I'm at at various stages in the game. And there will be people that show up in my life and people that show up in, you know, everyone's life there to help. If, I'm looking if my eyes are open. Abre los ojos. Open your eyes. <laughs> I don't want, well, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're saying, because one of my questions was going to be, is there a benefit to instilling mentorship programs at, at a business? Like you see this with big companies or like, is that, that feels too forced to me? Should it be organic? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. If, or maybe we're the, talking about two separately different it things. It depends on the company. It depends upon you know, all those, I think that they're better off as naturally occurring sort of people are attracted to one another for whatever reason. People need each other for whatever reason. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of the, of the formal program because it feels forced. Okay. What are we going to do today? Well, here's the corporate outline of, you know, uh, let me ask you these questions. Right. You know, so I, but I don't know anything about any of those. Right. Do you think there's, um, Let's say once you already figured out you have a mentor, is there a point to a rhythm of intentionality to those to those meetings between you and your? I think if it's driven, I remember at one point, you know, you and I had a cadence of phone calls mm-hmm. that was driven by you. Right? Yeah. It wasn't driven by me. You know, you said, hey, I want to do this. This is the last thing you want. And I said, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this guy. Oh, great. No, um, it's. And again, I think the way the circle works is that, you know, sometimes you hear yourself saying things and you're like, oh, shit, you know, I need to be doing that in my own practice of life. Totally. And so there's a there's an immediate sort of exchange of energy, if you will, in a positive way that goes on between in that in that relationship. And, you know, going back to Don, I mean, you know, if I said the word I never said the word mentor to him. You know, yeah. he's never, you know, he's, he's, he's never acknowledged it. We would never, he'd be like, oh, no, you know, I mean, like, that's not a thing. Yeah. And he just, you know, does his thing. Yeah. So, well, if anybody's uh, still listening at this point or has fallen asleep, <laughs> uh, we're down to the, the last few questions here. So, the fast four. Okay. So, these are, I'm not going to ask any follow up questions. Okay. To these questions. Mm-hmm. Other than what you're doing right now and you cannot, Mail this one in. Other than what you're doing right now, what other profession or business would you like to take take a stab at? Mm, you know, I would see myself in a role of like a somehow kitchen helper. Somehow, uh, <laughs> I love being in the kitchen. kitchen I yeah. love cooking. My wife's yeah. way better at it than I am. But I think there's something about the tactile nature totally. of 
preparing some, taking something from nothing to mm-hmm. something, giving it to someone, experiencing right. the joy that they get out yeah. of what you've prepared, what you've done together. So I think there's probably a hankering somewhere down in there for me to be part of kitchen or, help of some sort. Kitchen help. I mean, restaurant, sous chef, yeah, sous sous chef. chef. okay, taco trailer. Ooh, you know, who right. I have no idea. I'm down for that. I mean, I, I never thought about that like that before, but since you ask, I like it. No. What are you? Uh, what's something you're terrible at? Mm. What is something I am terrible at, man? I am so good at everything. No, um, <laughs> like mine is, uh, I, I am not on time for anything. Huh. I'm terrible at being on time. Cause I try to yeah, fill my day. We were much. late for lunch. Yeah. We were late for lunch yeah. because of me. Yes. Yes. Um, and what is something I'm terrible at? Um, I'm terrible at fly. You want me to ask your wife? I'm terrible at fly fishing. <laughs> um, no, I'm terrible <laughs> at fly fishing. <laughs> Oh, that's an excellent question. I don't do anything in my life that I'm terrible at. Um, <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was just thinking about that. It's like I sit around. I mean, I have a pretty, I'll say, awesome existence. What book are you reading right now? Right now. Right now. I am reading Spiritual Warfare by Jed McKenna. Okay. Write that down, everyone. And then what was the last thing? I don't know if you have your phone on you. What was the last thing you listened to on Spotify or Apple Music? I listened the last thing. to this morning. I listened to Michael Schellenberger on the Joe Rogan Podcast. Experience podcast. All right. He's running for governor of California. Okay. Which anyone would be better than Gavin Newsom. Okay. Well, this isn't a politics show. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So Cole, thank you for spending time with us today. This has been super fun and hopefully helpful to our sleeping audience right now. <laughs> Where can people find you online and get in touch? At Cole Does Capital on Twitter. That's it? Darebizcapital.com? Darebizcapital.com. Yes, you can find um, me there. But you can I love that I'm giving, you a comp- I'm giving my listeners a competitor's uh, website. Yeah. Plenty of fish in the sea. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care.